This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and Float Shark with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf, and Joe Fit. Hey. Yo. God dang it, Joe. <laughs> it's always a race to we have a, talk first. <laughs> Not like we're talking enough on the podcast. I have a disadvantage, though, because i got to hit the record button. I know. I'm seeing this gap in time where I'm like, oh, that's my end. Go. Yeah. Go Joe, seize the moment. Joe's like those 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 people on Facebook and Reddit and stuff that like, when a new post goes live, they first just, comment. They just write first comment, and you're like, <laughs> Got what? It. Thumbs what? up. Why? <laughs> I'm, I'm so famous in comment land of different social media networks for being just the first comment on oh, everything. Yeah. People know me everywhere. I'm international love. They oh. love my comments. Yeah. So you're, you're Skinny Cheeks 1943? <laughs> I do know. <laughs> 1943. I don't know where... where How that, old do you think I am? I don't know Jesus. where that username came from. <laughs> I'll take it. You know, you're just skinny. a World War II buff. <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> In skinny jeans? No, skinny oh. cheeks. <laughs> yeah, but you need skinny jeans for skinny cheeks, right? Not necessarily. Which cheeks are we talking about, Matt? <laughs> it's your username, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought about the meaning behind it. <laughs> Oh, man. Anyway, let's talk about what we're going to talk about on this podcast today. I guess it's not skinny cheeks anymore. Today, we've got the Ask Man. Ask the, Man. The Choose Man. Choose Man. <laughs> Ryan Levesque is joining us on the show. And this this was a fun call. This was this was really cool. He has a new book that just came out called Choose. Mm-hmm. And he's actually giving it away for free. Bam. If you go to, let me look at this URL here, choosethebook.com slash hustle. He said that our audience can get a free hard copy version of that book. So go to choosethebook.com slash hustle, and Ryan's going to hook you up with that. In addition to not just a book you're getting, you're actually getting like the audiobooks for free when you go there, and you're also going to get all these training videos. He has like a whole bonus members area, mm-hmm. so it's pretty rad. Yeah. He's, he's It's probably the best like book giveaway type thing that I've seen done. So yeah, go snag it. It's cool. Yeah. Do and it. on this episode, I mean, we cover a lot of ground because we really wanted to dive into what his sort of choose methodology is. And it's it's really a, a sort of framework for to decide what business opportunities and what niches to per, uh, to pursue in your mm-hmm. business. And he has like a, a legitimate framework, like it's got to meet these five criteria and, you know, it's got to be based on, you know a handful of things i don't want to i don't want to give spoilers well, away. he has like the red light yellow light green light concepts that he it's very objective we'll say yeah. he has like a system to this whole thing and he lines out exactly how to do a lot of that stuff yeah obviously the book dives like super deep into it you know what my two favorite parts of this interview are yes no, I don't. <laughs> Go for it. My uh, my first favorite part of this interview is when he explains how picking your niche is uh, sort of relevant to stock trading and mm. like technical analysis of stocks. Yeah, I felt that analogy was really cool when he explained it. I kind of got a little aha moment there. And then also when he talked about uh, the home brewing niche. Oh yeah, <laughs> because. We have a home brewing. We well, said business. it's in the book, so once we get the book, he was like, "Oh yeah, there's a cheat sheet right there. Just copy that." Yeah, exactly. Like, Thanks, exactly. Ryan. <laughs> so we talk about a lot of good stuff, and he's going to help you understand exactly which business models and niches to pursue, and that's really what Choose is all about. And it's really cool because don't think it's just for you if you're beginning, or you know, or for you know, kind of like the novice of entrepreneurship because it's definitely can be very applicable to if you're a consultant for people who are trying to bring new products or offers into the world or just you adding another product line. Um, I could see where Matt and I have probably lacked in some of this (laughs) due diligence in the past and probably still currently, but you know, that's just, uh, we can always improve. Yeah. It's okay. So that's what we're going to choose to do. That we're going to choose to do like that. what I did there? Yeah. Yeah. That was smooth. You know what you should choose to do? <laughs> I'm going to tell wait. you about these notes that we have for you. Is that what, is That's that where I was going to go. I thought so. <laughs> but I was I was doing my, my salesy like transition. Oh. You know what you should choose. Oh, I'm tell gonna, them, Joe. Oh, I'm going to choose to turn on my sales voice, my <laughs> used car pitch man <laughs> voice. If you go to this <laughs> website, tell them what they're going to get. All oh, right. So when they go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp comp c o m p you're going to get the free notes for this episode and the one previous to this or the one after depending on the time you get there cuz yeah. it's basically free for a limited period of time about a week yeah and uh get the notes because we have someone taking the notes for every single episode so you might as well snag some free ones yeah hustleandflowchart.com/comp c o m p they're there waiting for you along with another episode free notes mm-hmm. 
and uh, make it a thing. Just check them out because yeah. they're they're really cool. I promise. Yes, yes. They're and not in the vault yet. They're not in the vault yet. We have not locked them away for good. Not quite yet. But be <laughs> quick. <laughs> be quick because they will. All right, we should go talk to Ryan Lavec. Let's do it. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. What's up? It's awesome to be here. I'm pumped to dive right in. Yeah, man. So you've been on a, I know you've been on a tear lately with podcasts and media and all that stuff. So appreciate your time, man, with the new book coming out here with Choose. Yeah, I know. It's uh, awesome to be here. I've been looking forward to chatting with you guys and, and yeah. talking. And, uh, you know, I just want to earn a coveted place on that bookshelf what? behind you. That is like, that is my goal in life. <laughs> I want to book on that shelf and uh and have a permanent place if i've done that i've done my job well you may have actually already done that because i do have the ask book i don't remember if i have it on kindle or on print though yeah, i'm like <laughs> i know we both have that i don't know there it is this, <laughs> this one right here <laughs> choose is on the way to my house i know that much so <laughs> it's in transit awesome. yeah man awesome. that's my goal but, cool yeah so it's i know we have a lot of listeners that have oh matt just found it <laughs> um, <laughs> there it is there you go i wasn't gonna sleep <laughs> until i go. found awesome. it awesome <laughs> i could have gone terribly wrong that could have been like it was on the bookshelf, but uh, it was actually didn't make the cut. So it's <laughs> yeah, now in the box. Limited space over here. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have a lot. I know everybody, everybody, they should. A lot of folks know about the ask, ask method in the previous book and just what that, I feel like it, it kind of like created a wave of fury around the whole serving your people, you know, different software tools probably came from that, including, I think you have your own, right? Yeah, it led us to, you know, uh, on the heels of Ask, one of the single biggest holes and questions people uh, uh, came to us with was, this is great, love the methodology, but what uh, tool do you recommend? Mm -hmm. And um, the truth is there was nothing, and still to this day, isn't anything on the market that does uh, exactly what you needed to do. So uh, I decided to uh, invest in a company called Bucket.io, which is a technology yeah. for building quiz funnels, survey funnels, assessment funnels, um, and really is uh, a hand glove software solution for implementing the ask method in, uh, in your business. So right um, it wasn't there. So I had to invest in it and, um, you know, you manifest it, you know, yeah. law of attraction. <laughs> that's it yeah so how do you i know you came from a completely different background so for those that don't know you walk us through a little bit of your story the origin story that got you to this point and uh, yeah and then sure. we'll take it from there sure man yeah so um you know so for me a little bit about me so i'm i uh, grew up blue collar uh first person in my family to go to college my dad worked nights uh, our entire life um basically loading boxes on the back of a truck and my mom uh, cut hair in the basement of our house. And so, uh, again, first to go to college in my family, when I got into an Ivy League school, it was like a really big deal in my kind of extended family. And so uh, I studied uh, at Brown and studied neuroscience and Chinese. Wow. And, uh, you know, being the the great hope in my family, my, my parents expected that I was going to go to medical school and become a, <laughs> you know, a brain surgeon, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, my best friend in college uh, actually uh, is a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic. So he went all the way. He went, you know, studied, we were studying neuroscience together. He went all the way. He's a neurologist and now at the Mayo Clinic. Um, but uh, I, I knew it wasn't for me. I didn't know what was for me. So after college, um, I worked on Wall Street. I worked uh, in investment banking and um, still had this interest in Chinese that I wanted to pursue. So moved from New York to China and lived in China for about five years uh, with my wife and um, was a uh, uh, working for the insurance company AIG, basically opening up sales offices around the country. Mm -hmm. um, and it was around this time that I kind of had what I call my quarter life crisis, <laughs> where uh, I kind of woke up one day and just said, wait, time out. Like, is this it to life? Um, and at that point, I had, um, you know, I was working a, a good paying job. And um, I kind of had this moment where I felt like there was more inside of me. Uh, I felt like there was more to give. I felt like there was more that I wanted to do. And um, I just kind of had this, this moment where like I flashed my life forward and I saw myself and my boss. He mm -hmm. was close to retirement age. He had worked in the insurance industry his entire life. He was the president of China for AIG. So huge responsibility. Sure. Um, and um, I said, if I keep doing what I'm doing, that's who I'm going to be. I'm going to be that guy. And I have a ton of respect for, um, for, for that for that man, but I saw my life and I said, that's not my life. 
and ended up writing this crazy like 20 page letter to my mom that uh, my editor like forced me to publish it in ask it was never meant to like see the wow. light of the <laughs> very embarrassing vulnerable letter that i wrote to my mom basically saying what i'm telling you but in much more um sort of emotional detail and um and uh it was around that time that this is 2008 mm-hmm. it was around that time that the uh, world financial crisis hit and one day I woke up, uh, went to my office and found the Wall Street Journal Asia edition on my desk and the headline read, AIG to file for bankruptcy. Hmm. That was the moment that I discovered that the company I was working for uh, was about to go out of business. And uh, uh, it played out a little differently. The US government ended up bailing out AIG and a few other companies, but this hmm. is when you know, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns and all these companies basically you know, cease to exist. Mm -hmm. And, um, I called my wife that day and I said, um, honey, um, I've obviously been talking about starting a business and doing my own thing for a while. I think this is the sign I've been looking for. And literally that day, guys, I wrote up my resignation letter, printed it up, signed it, run, ran to my boss's office because I was so afraid I was going to lose the courage to do it Mm -hmm. and gave it my two weeks notice. I sold everything that I owned, this is in Shanghai, sold everything that I owned, uh, moved in with my wife. It sounds like, well, why would you move in with your wife? <laughs> she was in grad school in Hong Kong. So uh, we both went to college together at Brown, um, lived in New York together where she went to grad school. Then we moved to Asia together um, and uh, she pursued a PhD at Hong Kong University. I'm in Shanghai. So I sell everything that I own, move in with her in student housing in, in Hong Kong, um, in our know, mid to late twenties and, um, started our first business. Wow. And that's kind of how it all, how it all began and how it all started. It was, was the first business, if I remember collect correctly, wasn't it something like a Scrabble tile necklaces or something, something along those lines? <laughs> you nailed it, man. Yeah. You said it, not me. I did, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I, could, I could hook you up with a gift if you'd like, you know, just <laughs> you still got them. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. So, um, it was, yeah, it, you're exactly right. It was the first niche. And I talk about this in Choose. Um, and everyone wants to know, like, how did you get into, why Scrabble tile jewelry? Like, that's the most random, <laughs> like, thing ever. And the truth is, it is pretty random. Um, but the reason why we went into it is, was at this time where I'd been, like, talking about starting a business. And every night, probably at dinner, when my wife would come back uh, from university, you know, I'd be talking about some idea. Like, oh, what about this? Like, let's, let's do this. And, like, all these ideas. I think one day, she finally got so sick and tired of hearing me talk about uh, these ideas. She was like, all right, what about this? And she said, take a look at this website. It's called uh, Etsy.com, which is a huge site today, but it like just started mm-hmm. in 2007, 2008, right around that time. Um, so check out the site. Um, she said, it's like eBay for handmade goods. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it, it's like a site where you can sell jewelry and crafts and things like that. It's like for crafters. Yeah. Um, and, and look at, there's this jewelry that's selling like crazy. And it's exactly what you said. It's Scrabble tile jewelry. Mm-hmm. And it's, Jewelry that's made by combining Scrabble tiles with origami paper and resin in a very specific way that's made into pendants and pins and all sorts of brooches and all sorts of different things. And so she said, it's selling like crazy. And her logic, which was sound was, look, we're in China. We have access to all the origami paper in the world. Uh, we could, we have access to inexpensive labor. We could set up a little factory in Southern China, manufacture this jewelry and import it into the United States. Yeah. And I was like, we are not doing that. <laughs> we are not doing that. Um, closed the book on the idea. I thought it was done. Then a couple of weeks later, she, um, she, we're having, again, one of those conversations where I'm all over the map. I'm like, do we do this? We open up a McDonald's franchise. Do we do an import-export company? All the crazy <laughs> ideas that I had. And she said, um, well, what about the Scrabble tile thing? I was like, honey, I thought we closed the book on that. She's like, no, 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 no. Check this out. She turned her computer to me and she said, look at this woman's shop on Etsy. Now, she wasn't selling the jewelry. She was teaching people how to make the jewelry. Mm. What she was selling was a digital tutorial on how to make the jewelry. And we looked at it. My wife said, check it out. She's selling these things for like 30 bucks each. Digital product, all profit. And look at how many she's selling every single day. See, on Etsy, you can see a person's sales history, just right. like eBay. So you can see how many, someone's, how many products someone sells today, yesterday, the day before that. So she just went back in a, for a, a month or two and we found that this woman was selling on average like 30 copies a day wow. of the thing. And we did the math and it's like, that's like 10 grand a month. And it's like all profit yeah. selling this little tutorial. So my wife bought it and she's like, I think I can learn how to make this jewelry. 
I think I can learn how to make it and we can teach people. I bought this woman's tutorial. It's not very good. It's homemade. It was like done in Microsoft Word. There are all sorts of problems with it. I think we can do better. And so that's what we did. So we, we created this guide. We started selling. This is the first thing I ever made any money doing <laughs> online. We started selling this first month. We sell a couple of copies. Then the next month, a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand bucks, 5,000 bucks, 6,000 bucks, $8,000 a month. And I, tell, I remember turning to my wife like one day, I was like, honey, we're going to get rich. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> like, this is awesome, you know? Um, and then literally the next month, our sales went down to almost zero. Whoa. And at this point, um, I quit my job. My wife's in grad school. She's not making any money at all. We're living in Hong Kong, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world. And we've basically run through most of our savings at this mm. point. And we look at each other and say, oh crap, mm. what do we do? And uh, my wife said, well, I'll finish my program. She finished her program and she said, I'll get a job. And she, uh, she got a job as a museum curator, which is what she went to school for, mm -hmm. as a museum curator in Brownsville, Texas, which if you're not familiar where that is, it's, it's on the Texas-Mexico border. Wow, down uh, south, yeah. Super south. It's, it's a historically important trade path between Mexico and the United States. But uh, we moved and lived in the poorest zip code in America. And that's not an exaggeration. It is the poorest city in America. Oh, wow. And we lived in the poorest zip code in America. We had a tiny little, my, my wife in that job was making $36,000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, didn't have enough money to ship our stuff back from China. So we had to donate and sell everything that we owned. We had mm -hmm. one suitcase each, moved back to the States and basically started over. Wow. We had a 500 square foot apartment, bars on the windows, uh, a mattress on the floor, two lawn chairs. That was our living room furniture. And we got those lawn chairs when we opened up our bank account in the U S that was like the gift. Oh my God. Wow. Like, the chairs like that. You sit on the side yeah, of the, yeah. we, got, we got one of them, but my wife's a good negotiator. So she asked for two. So we got two <laughs> for each of us. Um, and that was it a $50 a week grocery budget. We didn't have any cable. We didn't have anything, no Netflix, nothing. And I just, you know, had a laptop an internet connection. And I drove my wife to work to and from work every single day in our um, old beat up car. And uh, just uh, got to work. And um, I learned from that experience in the first business. And it's one of the lessons I talk about in Choose, the importance of choosing the right market and the importance of not going into a fad market. Mm. That's what the Scrabble tile market was. It was just a fad. It was like Beanie Babies or Fidget Spinners or one of these things that like exploded at the time, and it's funny, from time to time, I have people who reach out to me who like send me little photos and be like, yeah, my, my <laughs> daughter got me one of those or my, my mother got me one of those or yeah. something like that. Um, but it's largely forgotten. It's like one of these things that just poof. Sure. Um, and um, you know, I learned the importance of not going into a fad market. And it's um, uh, one of the first lessons I talk about in Choose is uh, what I call one of the five market must-haves. And the first market must-have, one of the factors you want to be looking at when you go into any market. And it's something I learned uh, from personal experience. It's something I learned studying not only the 23 niche markets that I've gone into in the last 10 years, uh, but the markets uh, my clients have gone into, our students have gone into, um, and looking at the factors that separate those markets that were successful from the ones that weren't. Um, it turns out that there are uh, these five market must-haves. And the first market must have is what we call going in an evergreen market. Now, an evergreen market, in contrast with the fad market, the, the Scrabble market, is one that was relevant 50 years ago, and it'll be relevant 50 years from now. So things like insurance, so, like all of these like foundational types yeah. of things. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Things that are, you know, um, been around forever. So like a, a, the example that I'll share is the, the next market I went into, um, which is, uh, so I started, you know, uh, looking into... Um, I said, all right, if this Scrabble tile thing is a hobby that lasted like five minutes, well, what are the hobbies that have been hobbies forever? Mm. Like, what are the things that people have been doing forever? And I started doing research and came to find that the oldest hobby in America, the thing that's been around forever, and it's the number one or number two hobby in America and has been for close to 100 years, it's gardening. Mm, okay. That's awesome. I was going to guess right? fishing. So, <laughs> yeah, fishing or something. Yeah. 
then something like 100 million Americans consider uh, gardening to be a hobby. Now, of, of course, it takes different shapes and forms. There's urban gardening and there's, you know, uh, um, you know herbs and mm-hmm. some of it's vegetable gardening. And so there's different forms, but gardening in some way, shape or form. The other main hobby is, is reading, by the way. So it's reading and gardening, number one and number two, for mm-hmm. anyone who's curious. Um, but so I started looking at gardening and I started looking at sub niches within the gardening market. And um, I was making a big, long list of possible niches. And on that list uh, was a market that came to mind the market of orchid care. And the reason why orchid care is in caring for the flower orchids mm-hmm. uh, came to mind is because when we lived in China, uh, my wife uh, asked uh, me to uh, buy a bunch of orchids for the apartment we did. And literally like within like a week or two, they all died. Yeah. They're and pretty so easy to kill. <laughs> they're, they're hard to keep alive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And so I was like, all right, well, if we have this problem, probably other people have had this problem too. So it's just like one of the ideas on the list. Yeah. Um, and then it sort of passed all the other tests that I learned to be important. Um, and so uh, went into the orchid market, applied the ask method. So uh, went through what's now come to be known as the ask method to understand that market at a deep emotional level, understand the buckets that exist in that market, the different groups uh, or segments of customers in that market who have different needs, wants, and desires. Um, and then grew that business uh, from nothing to $25,000 a month in 18 months. At that point, uh, we had the confidence for my wife to quit her job. So she quit her job. Um, we moved from Brownsville, uh, on the less than a mile away from the Mexican border up to Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. which is where we've been for about the last 10 years. Um, grew that business to half a million dollars a year. Um, and, uh, in contrast to the Scrabble market, that orchid market, that business that we built over a decade ago, 10 years later, still continues to pay our living expenses to this Mm. day. Wow. Now I share that as an example in contrast, when you have a market, when you choose a niche that checks off the boxes and sets you up for success, not in the short term, but for years and potentially decades. Got it. I love that. So yeah, yeah, with the five mar- markets, all that stuff. I know the book. You lay out so many different, different specific things that people can kind of start with. You also have a process. It looked like of, uh, it's kind of. I think it was a three tier process of really brainstorming, then trying to kind of discover some of these markets. I know you use Google a lot, a lot of the keyword research, and then you finally make a move based off of all of this stuff. Can you kind of walk us through a process? Yeah, you know, so at the highest level, right? So the highest level is uh, brainstorm, test, choose. Mm-hmm. And I want to back up just for a second. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how this process came about and why, um, why this process, like why is this so important? Well, with Ask, um, we joked about it, it's on your bookshelf. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, the book sold literally hundreds of thousands of copies worldwide. And when you write a book like that, that reaches so many people, you get uh, letters and emails from people who say the book changed their life. But you also get some letters from people who say, dude, (laughs) I read your book and it didn't work. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Um, As an author, when you get letters like that, it makes you like wonder, well, what did I do wrong? Where did I miss the boat? Where did I mess things up? And so I started, uh, kind of kicked off what became like a three-year research project to really understand why some people were having success and other people weren't. And when I looked at the thing that was causing people to fail, all roads kept pointing back to the same thing. And that's this people were choosing bad markets. Mm-hmm. And there's this metaphor that I use in the book that I think is helpful to understand. And, it, and it's sort of like this, like when you start a business, it's kind of like tossing your raft in a river, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you can have the best raft money can buy. You can have the best equipment money can buy. You can hire the best crew in that raft with you to help you row. You can row 18 hours a day, mm-hmm. but if that raft is pointed in the wrong direction, or that raft is in a river that doesn't have any water in it, you're never going to get to your destination. Right. And that's what I realized is people were choosing bad rivers. You know, in mm-hmm. Ask, I share the methodology I use to enter 23 different markets, but what I didn't teach was how and why I chose those 23 markets specifically. Like, what was it about mm-hmm. those markets as, as, as opposed to the millions of other possible markets out there? Uh, what was it that separated them? And so uh, within that, I started kind of being curious around, um, well, what is it that makes a good market? Like, what does that mean? It's easy for uh, like the three of us to say, you know, um, choose a good market, right? Mm-hmm. Choose a good, but what the hell does that mean exactly? Right. Mm-hmm. And I got that question out all the time. Like, have I chosen a good market? And so I didn't know how to answer that question. And so I started looking at first the 23 markets that we've gone into and candidly, some have been more successful than others. And so I wanted to know what was it that separated the ones that were home runs 
versus the ones that were not as successful. Mm. I then did the same thing with our students and our clients and looked at our most successful students. What was it that separated them from everyone else? And uh, what I discovered in that process is that there are seven factors, seven tests to determine if your market is a green light, meaning proceed, Mm -hmm. a yellow light, proceed, but watch out. There's some red flags and you may want to be careful or a red light, meaning you do not want to go forward with this thing. You want to start over. So with that as the backdrop to answer your uh, question that, Mm -hmm. um, that led this off, the process is to brainstorm, test, choose, brainstorm a list of possible market ideas, possible business ideas. And I take people through in the book, a number of exercises to do that. Then once you've come up with those ideas, run them through these tests and you run them through these tests in such a way that if something doesn't pass the first test, that's it. You can just cross it off the list. But if it passes that first test, you move to the next test on the list. And then when you finish that testing process, your list, you're left with a handful of possible ideas. And then it's the process of choosing. How do you choose which one is right for you based on the final list of candidates that you've arrived at after this process? So at a 30,000 foot level, that is the process in a nutshell. And it's predicated on actual results. It's predicated on not theory, but um, what I and my students and my staff and my team, what we've seen actually work in uh, the markets that we've had experience in. I love that. And this is, it reminds us, uh, or reminds me of a conversation we had with Todd Herman just a few days ago and how, you know, he deals with a lot of people in the sports market. Whereas if it's entrepreneurs, there's really no boundaries. Like everybody Mm -hmm. thinks, oh, I could just do whatever you want. Well, you can, but the problem is there's a lot of avenues and rivers, like you were saying, that are total red lights that, and you would never know, maybe it's too late. And it's funny because we talk to a lot of successful people on the show and just in our network and they're not going through a process, a systematic process like this. And still, like it's going to hurt you even more, I would imagine, at that level, rather than just starting off, you know, where you're kind of scrappy and maybe not putting that much money into it. No, I was saying, you know, the, the thing that comes to mind when you said that immediately is um, what's interesting is I, I personally, me, I'm a very risk averse entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. I am not like your classic entrepreneur who, you know, goes all in, like, you know, throws caution to the wind. And I... Uh, was very reluctant. Like I needed that kick in the pants of my uh, company, AIG, uh, about to go bankrupt to give me the the like the fire under my butt to start sure. my own thing. Um, and I think there are a lot of people, at least in my world, that their situation is as follows: they're not living in a cardboard box on the side of the road. Their life is good; mm-hmm. it is fine. But there is this fear. People are afraid of screwing up their good life in order to go after what they really want. Mm. In other words, people are afraid to give up good in order to go for great. Mm. And the reason why I wrote this book is because I know there's so many people out there that are afraid to go all in. Like I know for me, um, I'm willing to do the work. Like if you tell me that if I climb this trail. I'm going to get to the summit. I'm going to get to the top of the mountain. I'm willing to do the work. Mm-hmm. And I think most people are like that. They know if they say, if, 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 if I, if, okay, you're telling me if I climb this trail, if I walk this path, I'm going to get to the top, I'm willing to do it. But what scares people is when they get to the, at the bottom of the mountain and they don't know if the path is actually going to get them there. Right. It's the space and in between. This process is designed to help you have clarity and confidence that the niche, the market, your business idea is one that is set up to succeed. In other words, it's not one that you're just going to invest time and money and energy into and spend months or years of your life and find out that it's a path that was never going to take you to the top of the mountain. Right. Like it's just a path that's going to keep spinning you around in circles at the bottom, right? (laughs) Nobody wants that. Um, And so that's um, why I wrote this book. And that's why, um, you know, I think for anyone who's in that situation, this process can help you in a huge, huge way. Got it. I love it. Yeah. And it sounds like it's, it's, 
it could be applied to any kind of entrepreneur. It sounds like even if it's someone who's never had a had a beginning, just totally fresh to someone who's been in it for twenty years. Yeah, well, it's that, similar problems all the way. It's just the extremes of those. Well, that's that's what uh, my, one of my next questions was going to be. You know, let, let's say somebody's already in a market. They've already picked their market. They've already kind of established. They're already kind of going down a path, and maybe they're they're listening to this, going, you know what, the market I'm in, maybe that's not so evergreen. Maybe maybe telling people about pogs isn't like the best path forward you know like maybe maybe they're in a niche that's like that's a new one. <laughs> i gotta get my slammer problem. out man <laughs> what, what what advice would you give them would you would you tell them to start shifting into different niches and start kind of working on a backup plan or you know where where does somebody go from there yeah you know so um there people tend to be in one of two situations situation one you've got an existing business um you may be listening to this right now and if your business uh if it feels like you've been paddling that raft against the current and you've been busting your butt and it's like, gosh, I'm working so damn hard and I'm not getting to where I want to go. Chances are you may be in a yellow light or red light market. Mm. And uh, the good news is that sometimes all it takes is a slight shift, a slight pivot, a slight tweak in your direction to turn the thing around and have that current at your back. So I'd encourage you if you're in a business right now and maybe you haven't gotten the traction that you want to get, things aren't things are coming a lot harder than it feels like it should be coming to get things going, then I'd encourage you to go through these tests in the book to look at your current market, your current business, and if it turns out that your business is a yellow light or a uh, a red light, sometimes all it means is making a slight pivot. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Uh, so one of the tests that we take people through in the book is uh, something around, uh, we call it the market sweet, so uh, sweet spot test, market size sweet spot test. Um, and the reason for this test is one of the most common questions I get all the time is um, uh, what size market should I go into? How do I know if my market's too big or too small? Like, I'm, am I limiting myself if I'm in too big of a market? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like that, you know, using our metaphor, it's like, you know, you don't want to toss your raft in, um, in a river that doesn't have any water in it. But at the same time, you don't want to toss your raft in the middle of the ocean because you're just going to get swallowed up whole, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be a cruise liner. You need to have a big budget. You need to have a cruise liner budget to attack an ocean-sized market. If you're a little dinghy, you're gonna, the waves are going to crash over you and swallow you up whole. So how do you know if your market is too big or too small? And it's a question, honestly, I didn't have a good answer to for years. And so uh, one of the things that we did in this research is, once again, we looked at our 23 markets. We looked at our students' markets, clients' markets. And I wanted to see, is there any correlation between market size and the success of that market. Mm -hmm. And what we found was fascinating. We found that every single one of our home run markets, the ones that just completely killed it, every single one of them were in this very narrow market size range. And the way we measured it was by evaluating the keyword search volume for each of these markets. And we did it using uh, a tool called Google Trends, which you guys are familiar with. Yeah. Um, we use Google Trends to evaluate the size of these markets. And every single one of our failures or markets that never really took off in the same way were either outside in terms of the size of the market being too big or too small. They were outside that like narrow band. Mm. And uh, literally for months, we were like, um, do... This was huge. Like when we found this, we're like, this is like, this is crazy. In the book, I call it the Rosetta Stone markets, right? And so for months, we we're like, do we share what these keywords are? Yes or no? Because like at the end of the day, you, you guys know this, like your, you know, your keywords, like once someone knows like what your most profitable keywords are, your most profitable, you know, niches, um, you're going to attract competition. Oh, because yeah. other people that don't have imagination are going to say, well, I'll just go, I'm not going to come up with my own market. I'm just going to go into that market because that's like, that checks all the boxes. Sure. Um, so we debated, do we reveal this, not reveal this? And in the end, uh, we ultimately decided that, um, listen, we may attract some competition, but we can do more good in the world than um, we would otherwise by sharing what these keywords are. So in the book, I show you, uh, number one, what these keywords are. And number two, how to determine what your bullseye keyword is. It's a process I take you through. So you can compare your bullseye keyword against these reference benchmark keywords and see, mm -hmm. is your market too big? Is it too small? Or is it in that sweet spot? So that's an example of one of these uh, seven tests that um, I take people through inside the book to help determine is your idea a green light or not. Now, to answer your original question, if you've got a business right now, sometimes it's as simple as if you're above that sweet spot, 
you may need to just niche down. Mm -hmm. Or if you're below that sweet spot, you may need to just niche up to get yourself into that range. And sometimes it's just a repositioning or redefinition of your business and your market that gets you into a position of success. I like that a lot. And and it seems like with timing, you know, there's a lot of folks like, you know, podcasting, for instance, right now is you, we actually looked at the Google trends yesterday. Very <laughs> upward trend right now. It's like hockey sticking right now. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of yeah. ridiculous. And is that was it really? Our, yeah, it really is. <laughs> so it's, I'm like, this is perfect. Yeah. But you know, yeah. back in 2010, when it was around then, a little early, you know, for a software company to create some cool analytics thing for podcasting, for instance, right. you know, right. a little, little early. So is that like, is timing a factor that you kind of play into this whole thing? Yeah. So one of the things that you want to look for, and I, I talk about this in the book, but um, it's uh, the book, there's a section of the book that almost reads like a stock chart book where mm. you're actually charting the actual trends of different markets. And so um, you want to be looking for, um, uh, there are a couple of things you're looking for when you look at the, 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 the cadence and sort of um, uh, 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 trending of your market. So first thing is this, you want to look at, is your market trending up or is it trending down? So you can do this by looking at Google Trends and seeing, is your market a growing market, a declining market, or is a stable market? Um, you also want to look at the cyclicality of your market. So most markets have some cyclical nature to them. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at the orchid care market as an example, you'll see that that market has some cyclicality to it. We just, uh, at the time of recording this interview, uh, passed one of the peak moments of that market, which is Mother's Day. Yeah. If you look at that market, you see Valentine's Day and Mother's Day. There are two peak moments every single year. Things decline in the fall months in the Northern, Hemis Northern Hemisphere and uh, kind of reach a low around Christmas and then start to pick up uh, after the new year, going into Valentine's Day, peaking at Mother's Day, starting to decline into the summer. You see that same trend every single year. So that will give you clues into what your income is going to look like mm. in your business. Now, if you look at a market in the health space, you're most often going to see a peak after the holidays at the first of the year, a slow decline over the, over the year, a big drop between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then it picks up again. You'll see that annual cyclicality. Now, why is that important? Well, listen, if you want to take a vacation every year in the month of January, you don't want to put yourself in a weight loss market because that's your most important month of the year. Right. Similarly, <laughs> Um, you know, if you have a market right now and there is cyclicality to it, you may want to balance that cyclicality with a business with a reverse profile. So an example uh, of a market that has a reverse profile to the orchid market, just as, a, as, a, as an example, mm -hmm. um, it's home brewing. Yeah. So if you brew your own beer at home, those that market tends to peak in the colder, more winter months and towards starts to decline a bit more in the warmer summer months. So you can offset your existing business with a business that has a reverse trend. So when you start diving into this and kind of geeking out over all this, you look for, you start to notice certain things. Um, you also start to see uh, signs of markets that are ripe for a, a rapid decline. So we talked about the importance of not going into a fad market. And I mentioned one of them offhand. If you go to Google Trends and you look at fidget spinners, mm -hmm. take a look at fidget spinners. What you're going to see is nothing a, 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 a sharp spike into the heavens, mm -hmm. followed by a sharp decline back <laughs> to nothingness. Um, and when you see these sharp rises like that, and that's the thing that I would um, be keeping an eye out on podcasting, um, you sh see these sharp rises like this, you need to be careful. More recently, we saw this happen in a market that when I say it, you're going to say, oh my gosh, yes, um, that um, caused everyone in the world at least on Facebook, to be talking about this thing. Mm -hmm. and that Could thing, Bitcoin? of course, was Bitcoin. Ah, yeah. nailed it. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin, right? I mean, there was a time not that long ago when you would go on social media, you go on Facebook, you could not turn the corner without someone talking about Bitcoin and, <laughs> and how Bitcoin's going to go up and it's going to go to you know $100,000, whatever, and, sure. and, and then people building courses and pod, you know, podcasts around Bitcoin yep, and yep. membership sites and exchanges and all these things. <laughs> And well, Lamborghinis, lots happened? of Lamborghini talk. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yes. 95% of those people are not doing anything with Bitcoin. Yeah. They're doing something else. Why? Because the market spiked up and you can look at the Google trends. It's directly in line with when the price of Bitcoin skyrocketed to the moon. I think it was at the end of 2017. Sounds about right. Yeah. 
spiked up to the moon, fell off a cliff, and you can see the search volume did the same thing. Yep. Yeah. So when you have a market that is a breakout market like that, you need to be careful because oftentimes it's unsustainable and it's a sign that it's a market that's going to pop. Yeah. And so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for what I call metronome markets. These are markets that just tick along every single year. So I talk about the orchid care market. You look at that market, it has cyclicality to it, but it's this sinusoidal curve that just waves up and down every single year. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for markets like that that are going to sustain you forever. Now, it's not to say the pot, I don't want to poo-poo on the podcasting thing, (laughs) um, but it's just something to keep an eye out for, right? Is this a market that that is growing and will kind of reach this stability? Or is it a market like Bitcoin that is going to explode up, be a breakout market, and then run the risk of uh, crashing? Mm -hmm. And like uh, analyzing stocks, the more markets you start to analyze, you start to see these patterns over and over again. You start to see that there are signs that the market you're going into um, is uh, is a green light, it's a yellow light, or a red light. And I talk about what those signs are uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, Joe and I, we've done a lot of stock trading in the past, but we've never actually applied this sort of technical analysis that you might do on stocks to businesses, which is is, is so smart. It's funny because Joe and I kind of looked at each other and laughed a little bit because you mentioned homebrew and that's actually yeah. one of the businesses that we own a we company do. in yeah. that niche is the homebrew <laughs> niche. Um, and we've Besides, seen this. I'll tell you right now. I mean, I could have I could have nailed that without you even telling me that. You guys are like the poster boys <laughs> for home brewing. I mean, we could have been like, like you are built for the home brewing course. Got Just beards, got hats. Got- it's going to sell. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You are guys like the poster children. For San that. Diego. So, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. And that's I, great. I, I, yeah, and, and I've seen that. We, we've we looked at trends before, Google Trends, and we use hrefs to dig maybe a little deeper you know, into the keywords specifically. And yeah, it's super cyclical, and there's ways to mitigate that. You know, if I guess there's a scenario where you know that you have cyclical products, or maybe you are aware something's going to run up like that, and yeah. maybe you have a, a horizontal... You know, I'm thinking like verticals and horizontals. Those are almost like a vertical thing that, you know, yeah, it's got a lifespan or I could sell it off or just cash it out. But then like right. this horizontal feeder thing, maybe you have a little bit more going on, not just fidget spinners, not just whatever the latest gizmo is. But, you know, you know that there's a system. It's going to happen. So I'm sure that there's like both sides of the coin there, too. Exactly. Yep. No, absolutely. And you can take advantage of those pops within the market. And I think that's the sweet spot is you found an evergreen market one that is uh, sustainable, right. um, one that you can take advantage of these pops happening within that market. Um, you know, one of the other market must-haves I talk about is it's 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 natural for us to to bring it up is uh, um, the second market must-have in that list. So evergreen is the first one mm-hmm. that's necessary but not sufficient. So uh, or evergreen is where you want to be, but it's not uh, sufficient. People have been drinking beer. Uh, for hundreds of years, Egyptian uh, days, yeah. for the next hundred years, like it's probably pretty safe. Like we can probably like it's yeah. it's a pretty safe bet unless we have like prohibition 2.0, in which case like <laughs> right. market load. Um, chances are you're going to be fine, right? Um, but it's not enough to be in an evergreen market. You also need market must have number two, which is an enthusiast market. Now, what I mean by an enthusiast market is that's in contrast to a problem solution market. Problem solution market is someone's got a problem in in their life, they solve it, and then they move on. Like they never want to think about that thing ever again. Uh, An example that um, uh, uh, makes it very clear is something like the wart removal market. Mm -hmm. Warts are evergreen. People have had warts probably for, you know, thousands of years. Um, they're probably not going away anytime soon, but yet it's a problem solution market. So a market where people, if they've got that problem, they want to solve it, move on, and they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's like, it's even uncomfortable for us to be talking about it right now, you right? You mean there's no it's enthusiasts like, out there on warts? I mean, I <laughs> that was the only one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No one's posting on social media like, look, guys, I got a wart today. Check this one out, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Duck, duck face wart hand. There's no like that doesn't exist, right? It's not happening. One day. Um, there are no Facebook groups. There are no, no one's signing up for an email newsletter on right. like wart enthusiasts. Like it just doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, now compare that to a market like uh, the dog market. Um, If you've got a dog, um, you're basically signing up for the next 10 years of your life to be a consumer in that market. Mm -hmm. And I know this because last year, my wife convinced me to uh, get a dog. We got a dog for uh, home protection purposes. Um, She is a menacing uh, four and a half pound chihuahua uh, rescue that they found on the side of the highway. (laughs) 
that we brought into our home, mainly to um, uh, scare off would-be uh, burglars. Um, and so she's uh, four and a half pounds. And I'll tell you guys, we spend more money on this damn dog <laughs> than anything that I can ever remember bringing into our home. Um, the doggy toys, the doggy treats, the doggy food, the doggy clothes. When it's you know it's cold, she needs a doggy sweater, the doggy bed, the doggy this, the dog, a million things. And it's there's no end. Yeah. Now, the big difference, the differentiating factor is in a problem solution market, you have to constantly chase after getting a new customer. You get a customer, you solve the problem, and you got to get a new customer. Mm -hmm. In an enthusiast market, you get a customer, and if you do a good job, you can sell to that same customer in the same market over and over and over again. And I realized along the way with some of the mistakes that I made, one of the businesses that we went into that didn't have success was the flea removal market. Mm. I thought fleas, evergreen, mm. been around forever. Mm. Fleas are like a problem that's not going away, right. but it's one of these things. You, you solve that problem. Someone doesn't, no one's talking about fleas in their carpet, in their home, whatever, in their furniture. No one's talking about it because it's embarrassing. And when you solve it, again, you're not joining the flea removal club of Austin, Texas. <laughs> just doesn't but you can think about it. There's the there's like ten Chihuahua clubs of Austin just in my city. There's a Chihuahua club in every city in America. There are clubs, Facebook groups. There are newsletters. There are just you know uh, 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 groups galore, um, and uh, that represents a market that is an enthusiast market, and that's the type of market you want to be looking at. Home brewing is a great example. I talk yeah. about the home brewing market in uh in shoes oh, nice. um, well, looking forward to getting that book because we will probably follow whatever advice you give us in that book <laughs> definitely yeah i love it yeah it's just it, it, i just love that knowing these factors and there are many factors and the five key ones that you were saying you know you can kind of mold maybe yeah if you're just in it for a quick win or if you're just starting off it's a great way to learn if you know yeah maybe it's a solution aware and you know you're only just going to get one customer each time it's not going to go mainstream uh, but it's a good way to kind of play with these markets and figure out how to bridge the gap between them you know if you can connect all of these i'd imagine you're you're on to something interesting now now, totally. Absolutely. Yep, do, do you have, sure. uh, how does it look like, uh, like, do you buy and sell businesses yourself personally? Or have you, do you have kind of uh, thoughts? I've, I've done a little, I did a little bit of that uh, early in my career. And, you know, really, you know, my, my path kind of was as follows. I, I launched um, uh, three businesses on my own. Scrabble Tile one, the Orchid Care one, the, and then my next business was Rocket Memory, teaching people how to improve mm. their memory. And truthfully, the reason why I started that business is because my parents wouldn't get off my back about not using my neuroscience uh, degree <laughs> around. So I had to do something that was re related to the brain. So I went into the memory improvement market. Um, and then after that, I started partnering with people in different niches that either had expertise in that market, um, experience in that market, a business in that market uh, to go into those different uh, niches. And um, along the way, um, learned a lot of things, uh, was involved in the acquisition of a few businesses, the sale of a few businesses, um, but, uh, for me, what I realized my passion, the thing that I became really good at and the thing that I enjoyed the most is really what I talk about in choose and ask. And that's the mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. the process of identifying a green light market. It's like, you know, Warren Buffett, where he's thumbing through, uh, um, you know, annual reports of all these companies and then finally finds one that checks off his investment criteria and he goes all in. Right. And I feel the same kind of rush when I'm doing that, going through all these different niche markets and studying them and looking at them. And when I find one that checks off all the boxes, it's like this jackpot, ding, 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 kicks off. And I'm like, this is a huge opportunity. I've got to find a way to get into this market. Yeah. And then the process of once uh, uh, I choose that market or you choose that market to go in and then ask the questions to understand that market at a deep level. I talk about some of the markets that I've had experience in and been successful in. One of them is the golf market. So that's one of my markets. Mm. Um, but here's the thing. I've, I've made literally millions of dollars in the golf market and I don't play golf. <laughs> I love it. I don't play golf. Um, and I share that story because I think a lot of people think that in order to be successful in a market that you need to be the expert yourself. Like you need to be, you know, you need to, you need to be the world's foremost expert in home brewing or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things I talk about in, uh, in choose is, um, that, uh, uh, it's something one of my mentors shared with me and, uh, I'll share it here. And it's, uh, remember this to so the fourth grader, the fifth grader is a genius. 
And I know this firsthand because I've got kids now and my older son, who's seven years old, the nine year olds that he hangs out with, like they are, they know more about the world than I know about the world. <laughs> it's like, like gods. They, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're gods. Um, but adults are the same way. Like yeah. you, you can be nothing more than a learner teaching other learners. I learned this myself back when I was at, at Brown for two years, I was a neuroscience instructor in Neuro One, which was the introduction to neuroscience course at Brown. And I did it as an upperclassman mm -hmm. and I led a section, meaning like a, a weekly section of the course for two years. And I sure as hell did not know anywhere near as much as our professor. Uh, our lead professor literally wrote the textbook. He runs the neuroscience program at MIT. He's wow. one of the most knowledgeable neuroscientists in the world. But he was struck with the curse of knowledge. He knows so much about neuroscience that when he's teaching the subject, when he's trying to uh, convey that knowledge to underclassmen, there's a gap. And so in the book, I advocate, one of the uh, uh, strongest things I advocate for is no matter what business you're in, to get into the business of selling education and expertise. Meaning if you're uh, in the home brewing market and you're selling home brewing equipment, you guys should have a course on selling teaching people how to brew at home, right? right. Home brewing 101, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you are a, uh, uh, a stationary store and you, sh and you sell stationary, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a brick and mortar store, you need to have an online course teaching people uh, hand lettering and better handwriting. Um, my, uh, guy that I, that uh, owns the gym that I work out at my personal trainer, mm -hmm. um, he has a local gym here in my hometown, but he also has an online membership site teaching people how to work out using the same techniques he does for his, uh, his clients in his gym. And I believe every business should have this so much so that it's the number one business model I advocate for, uh, uh that people start with and or add to their business. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, you don't need to be the expert. You can partner with people. You could uh, just be on the journey of learning yourself and just teaching people what you learn. And that's exactly what I did at Brown. Mm -hmm. I took the course a year earlier. I did well in the course and I was just teaching people what I learned. And you don't have to be any more of an expert than that. Yeah. Um, you really awesome. just need to be the fifth grader to the, your customer's fourth grader. Now, does, does, does passion factor in it all? Because I know that's sort of common wisdom that you hear all the time is, you know, find a thing that you're passionate about. And, you know, if you're not, you're obviously not a golfer, but you're in the golf niche. So, and I'm also, I can also see your five market must haves on my screen right now. And I know passion isn't one of them. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, you know, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I'll talk about passion. That's a, um, uh, it's a big, it's a common question I get, right? So um, people want to know, should I pursue my passion or should I pursue the idea that's profitable? And sometimes those things are aligned. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're at uh, odds with one another. Um, the way I'll answer it is like this. In, in this process of figuring out what market to go into, what business to start, there's a process that's very much external, which is what we've really talked about up until this point. You're analyzing specific factors in the marketplace. You're looking at things like the keyword search volume. Mm -hmm. You're looking at things like the amount of competition online. And all of these things factor in to determine if you've got a green light market or a red light market. But there's a second piece to the puzzle, and that's the introspective piece, where you're actually looking inside of yourself. And in this process of uh, writing this book and the sort of three-year research that I did leading up to it, I discovered that there are four different types of entrepreneurs. So people tend to fall into one of four buckets, if you will, when it comes to starting your business. And for you guys, um, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot as I kind of touch on each of these four. I want you to think about um, which one you most resonate with, which one you sort of identify with the most, because I think your uh, listeners will be very curious to know uh, which one best describes you. Let's do so four types of entrepreneurs. First one is what we call the mission-based entrepreneur. Now, mission-based entrepreneurs are the type of person that have a cause that they would die on the hill for. In other words, they've got some wrong that they want to make right in the world. Um, I talk about in the book, Christy Kennedy. Uh, Christy is a mom. Her son um, uh, is autistic and was bullied in elementary school. And so as a mom, she had to do something about it. She had to go talk to the principal and do something about it and get involved. Well, uh, before you know it, she decided to uh, make it her mission to eliminate bullying from her son's school, mm -hmm. which then led to eliminate bullying from the school district, which then led to building a company that's now worked with thousands of schools and school districts around America, eliminating bullying 
from their schools. Wow. And it all started because of this mission that she was really drawn to. Now, not everybody's wired that way. Not everybody has like this mission that they're really drawn to. Some people do, but not everybody. In contrast, you also have what's called the passion-based entrepreneur. And this is why um, I'm going down this road to answer mm -hmm. your question mm -hmm. um, topic around passion. There's some people that um, are very much drawn to making their passion their vocation. Mm -hmm. In other words, they've got something that they're super passionate about. Like in the book, I talk about Charlie Wallace. He's a guitarist, traveling musician, loves the guitar, wanted to find a way to make the guitar and playing the guitar and learning the guitar the focus of his business. And he built a very successful business teaching people how to play guitar online. It's a business that's grown to over $2 million a year wow. that he started from scratch. Now, he's an example of someone who's taken his passion and transformed it into his vocation. Now, the difference between those two, it may seem like, well, what's the difference? Mission-based entrepreneurs are the type of people who want to move people away from something negative. Passion-based entrepreneurs are the type of person who want to move you toward something positive and that which they love. Mm -hmm. But not everybody's wired that way. You got mission-based, you got passion-based. The third type is the opportunity-based entrepreneur. There's some people that are just wired in such a way that they look around and they're constantly saying, how is it that nobody's created a solution to this? <laughs> they look around, they're like, oh my gosh, I've got an idea. And they just sort of have this radar that's always up. They're kind of the entrepreneur in the most classic sense of the word. Now, you've also got a fourth type, which is actually my type. So spoiler alert, anyone curious, my type is the fourth type, which is called the undecided entrepreneur. <laughs> now, the undecided entrepreneur is the type of person who knows they want to be their own boss. They want to start their own thing, but they just have no idea what that thing is going to be. And for that person in the book, I recommend doing what I did, which is to start with what's called a practice business. Just like when we learned how to drive a car, the first car you learned how to drive in probably wasn't like your dream car, right? Mm -hmm. but it's a vehicle in which you learn the skill of how to drive. And you've been able to transfer that skill to your next car, your car after that. It's a skill that you have for the rest of your life. And very similarly, you guys know this. Mm -hmm. There's certain skills that you adopt and learn when you start a business. Setting up your website, setting up Facebook ads, bu building a product, setting up your shopping cart, doing email marketing, all the things you need to learn. And if you relieve yourself of the pressure of having to find that forever business, Take that pressure off your shoulders and that anxiety associated with that and just start with the practice business. You can re re relieve yourself from focusing on the outcome and instead focus on the process. Mm. So um, with that in mind, we got four types of entrepreneurs. I'm curious, <laughs> of those four, if you had to pick one, if there's one that maybe resonates more with you than the others, or maybe it's a combination, um, do you think you're more mission-based, passion-based, opportunity-based, or were you undecided uh, when you were first starting your business. So when you I'm were, uh, oh, when we were first starting, is that the criteria? Well, go ahead. Well, however, whatever comes to mind. My gut was like the whole way through, I was like, shit, I, th I feel like I can relate to all of this because mm -hmm. I have, you know, the, the mission thing pops up when I'm like, okay, made enough money. Well, I, I want to do a bigger thing. And that we definitely have that. I'm undecided personally. I would say, I mean, the undecided thing is definitely like for me because when I think about it, there's a lot of things that I really enjoy doing, um, but I can't really say any of the stuff I'm doing in the business is stuff that I'm really passionate about. I enjoy doing a lot of it, but the stuff we're doing now, I can't guarantee is going to be the same stuff we're doing five years from now. If a bigger play comes along, <laughs> we'll probably, you know, and so I, I would say I'm between opportunity and just kind of undecided based on those criteria. Yeah, I would say our past, you know, 10 years are approving of that too, where it's like, you know, every couple of years or something new, we're always testing the podcast is a catalyst for a lot of that. Yeah. So yeah. It's and, cool. and it's and it's not uncommon for anyone listening to this right now for you as a human being and as an entrepreneur to evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for me in my case, I started very much undecided and I I, I needed my wife to pick something to finally say, all right, let's just do this damn thing and let's just make it a practice business. And if it works great, and if it doesn't, I'm going to learn the skills of starting a business mm -hmm. and um, have since evolved to, to kind of really discover what I'm personally most passionate about and uh, what that mission is. So it's not uncommon for you as an entrepreneur or anyone listening to this to evolve uh, over time. Now, here's the thing. With each of these um, uh, entrepreneurial types, there's a light side and then there's a shadow side. 
And the reason why I want to touch on this is because of your original question around uh, following your passion. Mm -hmm. So for the mission-based entrepreneur, if you're more of a mission-based entrepreneur, the thing you need to watch out for is many mission-based entrepreneurs tend to struggle with charging money for the thing that they believe in because they're so drawn to that cause. They believe in it so passionately that they struggle to make a business and a profit out of it. Passion-based entrepreneurs, the thing you need to watch out for if you're passion-based is you run the risk of taking something that you're once passionate about and transforming it to something that you're dispassionate about. Mm -hmm. Because if you love watercolor painting or gardening or playing the guitar and suddenly it becomes your (laughs) J-O-B, it's not that much fun anymore. Right. Now, if you're an opportunity-based entrepreneur, the thing you need to watch out for is that you don't wake up one day, 10 years later, and look back and say, why the hell did I spend the last 10 years of my life? doing this. You may have filled your bank account, but you've left this real empty sense inside. And if you're undecided, the thing you need to watch out for is that you don't constantly swim in that safe swimming pool of talking about that next big thing you're going to do or living in fear of failure or analysis paralysis. So there's a shadow side to each of these that you want to be aware of and make sure that you are cognizant of it So that way, when you are making that all important choice and choosing in your business, you're choosing something that's not only going to fill your bank account, but it's also going to fuel your soul at the same time. And for anyone who's curious, if you're not sure what type of entrepreneur you are, what type of business you should start, you know, based on your uh, lifestyle goals, your personality type, there's actually a free assessment that I take people through in the book and anyone can do it. You don't even have to buy the book. If you go to choosequiz.com, I'll take you through a series of questions to help you identify not only what type of entrepreneur you are, but what type of business you should start that's going to fit with those lifestyle goals, your personality type, if you're more introverted, more extroverted, um, the type of entrepreneur you are, and a number of different factors. Mm, Perfect. Thank you. And we'll link that in the show notes. And also, I know you guys have a URL you guys made for us to grab Choose Your Book. And I believe that is choosethebook.com slash hustle. And, That's right. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I want to do something super special for you guys because you guys are awesome. Uh, you're in the home brewing market and uh, you're <laughs> uh, doing some great things. And I wanted to say thanks for really doing this interview. So what 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 um, what we've done is this is um, you can of course buy the book anywhere. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at Barnes and Noble. It's twenty four ninety nine in the United States, thirty three ninety nine in Canada. Um, but I wanted to make uh, uh, a limited number of hardcover books available for free for your listeners. All I ask is that you pay, just cover the shipping so we can ship it to you and I'll ship it to you anywhere in the world. Uh, When you do that, I'm also going to hook you up with over $200 in bonuses as a way of saying thank you, including the audiobook. So if you're the type of person, um, listen, if you listen to podcasts, Mm -hmm. uh, if you're like me, you probably like listen to audiobooks. um, So I'm going to hook you up with that. Second thing I'm going to hook you up with is one of the biggest questions I get from people is, so you got these seven tests in the book. What are examples of markets that pass all the tests? Like what are examples of green light niches? And so what I've done is I've uh, put together my personal list of the 25 niches I would be going into in 2019 if I had the time. These are niches that check off all the boxes. These are niches that, like I said, I would be going into. I've gone into 23 of them. This this would be 24, 25, 26. (laughs) This is my list. Um, So you can use these either as go into these markets if you want, or use them as inspiration to give yourself ideas of other things that you might want to go into. I'm going to hook you up with that, plus a whole bunch of other cool stuff, over $200 in bonuses. Uh, Just pay a few bucks shipping and handling, and I'll ship you a hardcover copy of the book anywhere in the world. And I think you said the link that we've set up is uh, choosethebook.com forward slash hustle. Mm -hmm. Um, And being honest about this, I, we only have a limited number of copies here in our office that we can do this for. So um, we've set a few aside, first come, first serve, and um, would be uh, happy to do this for anyone who's interested awesome. to dive in further. Thank you, man. Uh, we'll link that up as well. And yeah, after I bought the book, I hopped into the bonus section and that thing is pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like you said, I, I love the fact that not only the audio books there, because I'm always undecided which one's best for this book, yeah. you know, you never know, but you have all the supplemental materials in there. So anybody who's listening, you actually have those graphs that you were talking about. So yeah. you're doing it right, yeah. man. Thank you. Cool. Well, I appreciate that, guys. So awesome. once again, choose the book.com slash hustle and also choose quiz com go check those out thanks so much ryan this is this has been amazing yeah appreciate your time awesome thank you guys so much super appreciate it thank you all right
Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. Before taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out. All the good stuff from this episode, we actually have a nice, simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com, find this episode that you just listened to, and uh, give us your email address, and we'll send you the notes. Thanks for listening.